Hello, everyone. Welcome back to our training series. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, you're very, very welcome. We are on session six of 10 of this virtual training session. And I'm going to invite you to uh, let us know in the chat box who you are, where you're tuning in from. It's always nice to know who's in the audience and be able to greet a few of you. So I see already we've had Richard James at Cape Nature, Annalisa and Lawrence are with us again, Jenny from Neisner, Mark Jones from Plett, uh, Chris, Roseanne, Angelo from Reiterboss again, Ronnie from Stillby. So a few of our regulars, a couple of new names. Uh, great to have you all with us and please do keep popping those messages in the chat box. So just to recap where we've been so far, we have had our theoretical sessions that are out the way. Uh, we have one more coming in the last session, but for now we are firmly focused on identification and birds. And for that, we've got our special presenter, Justin Ponder. So last uh, webinar on Monday, he did the common birds of the garden root and the clay and karoo. Uh, really good to get to grips with some of those species that you'll see all over the place. And from now, we're going to focus on a few more specific habitats that we might find in the garden root and the clay and karoo. And today we're focusing on freshwater and estuaries. And um, there's a whole lot of that available, especially in the garden root section, but also in the clay and karoo. You'll often get birds aggregating at farm dams because water is such a scarce resource in the karoo. So it's good to know your freshwater birds, your estuary birds as well, uh, are going to feature today. Just for the context, for those joining for the first time, this is going to be focused on the garden root and the clay and karoo and is designed to upskill existing tour guides to become aware and perhaps active in the niche that is avi tourism or birding tourism. That being said, anyone from anywhere in South Africa or indeed the world uh, is very, very welcome. And uh, also, you don't have to be an aspirant birding guide. You might just be here to learn a little bit more, and that's perfectly fine. Just to remind you, I'm Andrew from BirdLife South Africa. We're leading this project in conjunction with Roland Forvac from Intoto Retreat. And our funders are the Western Cape Government and the Horowitz Cluster Biosphere Reserve. So today I mentioned we've got Justin back on. He's going to re be reprising his role as his uh, as a presenter for us. I hope you enjoyed his last presentation. He has pre-recorded this presentation because he is currently enjoying his, uh, his matric vac, believe it or not. Um, he is that young, but he's he's really, really brilliant. We're lucky to have him. He is one of the local experts along the garden route, but uh, he has pre-recorded, as I said, and I will share his presentation now for you. It's only about 25 minutes, so we should be able to get through it and have a fairly brief session, and we can all get back to our uh, Thursdays fairly quickly. All right, here we go. Let's see if I can get this right. Okay, I'm going to start it now. If someone can just let me know in the chat box whether you can see the uh, presentation and whether you can hear it once it starts. Thank you. Enjoy. Good morning, everybody. I hope everyone is doing fantastic today. Big thank you to Andrew for having me on. I am very excited to be presenting for you guys today. I do apologize for not having my camera on. I am not very tech savvy and I was not able to figure out how to turn my camera on for only a few slides. But anyway, let's get started. So this is birds of estuaries and freshwater. So the aim of this webinar is to showcase and teach the identification features of some birds that are likely to be found on estuaries, rivers, and other freshwater bodies in the Garden Root and Clean Karoo. This is not a full list of species that are found in this in these habitats or these areas, but it's rather just a list or a, a showcase of some of the more common species that you are likely to encounter at some point or another. Another quick recap on the area we are looking at. This is the Garden Root region of the Western Cape in South Africa, which stretches from about Riversdale in the west across to east of Plettenberg Bay and around Storms River and Nature's Valley in the east. Our northern boundary is the Swartberg Mountains, which runs along this contour over here. Okay, let's get straight into the birds. 
So first off, the African fish eagle. It's a bird that I'm sure many of you are quite aware of. The call of the African fish eagle is quite a, a staple among the South African culture. So the identification features of this bird is these big dark broad wings which it's, it's probably one of the largest wings of any uh, regular raptor in the in this region another diagnostic feature is the white head which you'll you'll see in adults on to another raptor is the african marsh harrier so the african marsh harrier is not quite as common as the african fish eagle but it is also very regular along estuaries and especially around reed beds so the african marsh harrier is quite diagnostic as it's got a typical harrier look it's got a long tail and longer thinner wings if you're looking at coloration the barring under the wings of the african marsh harrier is pretty diagnostic as you can see it's got them on the primaries and secondaries as well as on the leading trail or the leading edge to the wing it usually has a grayish head, especially in adults, and the underparts are usually rufous brown with a couple of white streaks. Another bird that's quite similar to the hardy dot ibis is the African sacred ibis. So the African sacred ibis is completely black and white, mostly white, although as you can see it's got those black uh, tips to the secondaries and primaries as well as a completely black head and neck and ball. Another one that's quite similar is the glossy ibis. The glossy ibis is pretty much restricted to waterways and estuaries, and it has these two white lines in front of the eyes. It also has the same long decurved ball as the other two ibises we looked at. So this is a young bird, but in the adults, They'll be a lot more rufously colored, and the iridescence on the wing is going to be a lot more prominent. So the African spoonball is also quite a diagnostic species. That large pink spoon-shaped ball is the diagnostic feature of this bird. It's also white overall, and has bright pink legs and face, as you can see over there. The hammerkop it's also a, it's also a bird that's pretty well known. As as you can see, it's got that head that's shaped like a, a hammer, as it gets its name, and overall it is quite brown. So this bird can sometimes be mistaken for a raptor when it flies, but that long ball is what differentiates it from any raptors. So on to our ducks. First up, we have the white-faced whistling duck. So this is especially common along farm dams, especially in the coastal regions of the garden route. As the name suggests, it has a white face and a throat, white throat patch. The neck is a chestnutty rufous color, whereas the wings and the flanks are barred black and white. It's got a distinctive black belly as well, which is not common in any other species around the garden route. We have three distinctive or three uh, teals that are in the garden route. The one is very uncommon, so I haven't mentioned that one. But the other two are the red bull teal and the cape teal. So the red bull teal, as the name suggests, it has that reddish pink ball, and then it has a dark black cap. The back of the red bull teal is a lot darker than any other teals we have as well. The cape tail is a lot smaller and more petite than the red bull tail, and it has a completely plain head. So as you can see, it differs whereas it doesn't have that black cap. It also has a much paler back than the red bull tail. The cape shoveler, this is one of our largest ducks. It has this distinctive yellow eye and a large black ball. The ball is a lot larger than other regular uh, ducks that we have. Overall, the bird is quite brown with not many striking colors, but it does have bright yellow feet and obviously, as I said, that eye. The spurring goose is one of our larger species that we have here. The pink face and ball is quite diagnostic. The other goose that we have in the area 
which I mentioned in a previous webinar, the common birds of the garden root and plain karoo. It doesn't have that pink face. Overall, the bird is quite brown, quite dark, but it has a white belly. The little egret. So the little egret is common pretty much at any water source anywhere in the garden root and clay karoo. It has a long, sharp black ball, but overall it's quite white. It does also have those black legs though. And then the yellow feet are also diagnostic. It's the only egret that we have that has yellow feet. The black crown night heron. So the black crown night heron is quite a chunky bird, if I can put it that way. It's it looks almost like it's quite short and stocky, like a well-built gym bird, if I can put it that way. So the diagnostic features of the black crown night heron is that black crown, as the name suggests, and then the black back. It's got the grey wings and the white underparts, and then it has the white plumes that come out of its head during the breeding season. The grey heron is another one of our regular herons. It has a large orange bull, which is quite powerful and can be used to catch a number of large species. The neck is quite pale grey. So if you remember from the common birds of the garden at Plain Karoo, where I mentioned the black-headed heron, the black-headed heron had a black nape, whereas with the grey heron, it has a completely grey nape. The purple heron is a lot smaller than the grey heron, but also pretty regular. Overall, the bird is quite chestnut colouring, or has a lot of chestnut colouring all over it and then it has the streaks on the throat. It also has that strong yellow ball, and the legs are also quite yellow. So we have two flamingos that are found in the garden root. Both are very common, but both have been seen a number of times and is fairly likely to be encountered at some point or another. The largest of the two flamingos, the greater flamingo, is a lot paler than the lesser flamingo. So overall, it's got a lot more of a paler pink coloration, and the bull itself is also quite light. On the other hand, the lesser flamingo is slightly smaller and is a lot darker pink. So as you can see, the bull is almost purple with how dark it is, whereas the whole coloration overall is a lot more pink than the greater flamingo. So the white breasted cormorant. It's the largest of our cormorants and is also very often found pretty much anywhere in the garden route, especially around water sources. Funny enough, I've also seen one while sitting on top of a mountain in the Klein Karoo, so they do move around quite a bit. So the, the white breasted cormorant has this large bowl, larger than any other cormorant, and has that bold white chest, as the name suggests. Overall, the bird is quite dark where its back, wings, and belly, as well as its cap, are all black. The African darter is another regular species, although not quite as regular as the other cormorants. The African darter has that long, sharp bull as well, with the white stripe that runs from the bull along the cheek. It has these white plumes, or uh, streaky scapulars, as they're called, coming from the shoulders, and it also has a much longer tail than a lot of the other species that are found in this area. So the blackwing stilt is also quite an iconic species. This bird actually has the longest legs in association with its size to any bird in the world as far as, I'm, as, far as I remember. It's got a very long thin black bull and then contrasting black wings which contrasts to the rest of the very snow white body. And it also has those long pink legs. The Pied Avocet, another quite regular species, especially in the Mossel Bay area, but it can be found pretty much anywhere, especially in the Karoo as well. The Pied Avocet has a black cap and nape, which contrasts to the rest of a mostly white body, but it also has this thin black bull which curves up at the tip 
which a lot of birds don't have, or most birds don't have actually. The blacksmith lapwing, although not often found in water, it is almost always found around water, especially on grassy areas like parks and uh, river walks. The blacksmith lapwing has a white forehead, which contrasts nicely with a black face and chest. It has black and white wings, as you can see, the leading edge of the wing is white, whereas the primaries and the secondaries, or half of the secondaries, are black. So on to our waders. The waders can be quite scary, especially for a newer birder, but it is a staple part of the estuaries and wetlands. So I think it is very good that we go over them, or at least some of them. So first up, we have the grey plover. The grey plover has the short, tough ball, and overall it is quite a greyish-brown appearance, although well-marked, as you can see. It is quite a bit larger in comparison to other waders, so we're going to take a look at some of the larger waders and some of the smaller waders. This is one of the medium-sized waders, so not as big as some of the other ones, but a lot bigger than the smaller waders. Next up, we have the Eurasian Wimbrel. The Eurasian Wimbrel has this long decurved bowl, which is quite diagnostic for waders, and it also has this dark stripe on the head. Overall, the bird is quite brownish. It's got a lot more of a spotted or barred appearance as well, and the legs are usually a grayish blue color. The common greenshank is also a very, very common species, but funny enough, I was not able to find any photos of it in either my collection or any of my friends' collections, who both or all gave me permission to use some of their photos for the presentation. So I've pulled off a photo from eBird here. So the common greenshank it has this grayish marked cap and nape, and then the diagnostic feature of this common greenshank is the robust but long and slightly upcurved bull. So if you remember the Pied Avocet, the Pied Avocet has a very much upcurved bull as well, but it is a lot thinner than the common greenshank. The common greenshank also is quite dark grey above and white below, with the dull greenish legs. The three-banded plover is one of our smaller waders. So the three-banded plover is also one of the most common and also a non-migratory wader. So it'll be here year-round, whereas most other waders are only here during the summer months. So the common ringed plover has this white ring around the head, which is quite diagnostic, but there are there's another species which has a ring around the head. So the diagnostic feature of the three-banded plover is, as the name suggests, the bands. It's got two black bands and then the white band. Overall, the bird is quite white below and then a darkish gray or brown above. It's also one of the smallest waders we have in the area, as far as I mentioned. Another smaller wader is the Kitlitz's plover. Kitlitz's plover also has that white ring around the head, but it also has a black ring around the head just below the white ring. Overall, the bird does not have the bands, but has a buffy plain chest. The African snipe is a species that is often seen flying away instead of perched, but it is also quite regular along any wetlands. So the African snipe has this almost disproportionately long bull, and it's also very straight, so it does not curve up or down. Overall, the bird is quite a heavy looking bird for its size, and it is very richly marked all over. As you can see, it's got some quite stunning colors. The common moorhen is also a species very many people have probably seen but have never known what it is. So, the common moorhen has this red bull with this red frontal shield as well, although the tip to the bull is yellow. Overall, the bird is quite a dark blackish grey, 
but it does have a white rump, which contrasts nicely. The red knobbed coot is very regular, especially if you're associated with, uh, if you know of rondeflay and lungflay, they have very large numbers of red knob coots. I think in Setchfield as well, there are lots of these birds. As the name suggests, it has the two red knobs on top of the head. The bull is very pale and white, and then it also extends up to a frontal shield, which ends at the top of the red knobs, or at the bottom of the red knobs. The rest of the bird is completely black, so that makes it quite easy to identify. The African swamp hen is one of our prettiest water birds, in which it is blue all over. It's a lot of it is iridescence, but some of it as well is just normal blue feathers. It has a white vent, which is quite diagnostic. If you remember the common moa hen, it has white on the rump and not on the vent. The bull is very heavy, and it also has that red frontal shell. But the bull is a lot larger than any other species. The black craig is quite similar in shape to the moorhen and swamp hen, but it is a lot smaller than the two of those. The black craig has this distinctive yellow bull, where, and it's also black completely all over. The legs are quite large, and it's a nice reddish pink color. The little grebe is the first of the grebes we're going to be looking at, and also the smallest. So the little grebe has this dark face and this diagnostic little white patch at the base of the bull. The nape is quite a chestnut color, whereas the rest of the bird is a lot more darker brown. The great crested grebe is the largest of our grebes. And as the name suggests, it has a crest on the head. It also has this rufous cheek, which is quite striking. The chest and throat are both white, which is nice and contrasting. If you remember the little grebe, it didn't have that white throat. As I said, it's also a lot larger than any of the other grebes and a lot more elegant, if I can put it that way. So the grey hooded gull is, although it is often found along beaches as well, it is often found inland around dams and estuaries too. So the grey hooded gull, as the name suggests, it has that grey hood which covers pretty much the whole face. The eye is usually quite pale and it has black tips with white spots on the, on the tips of the wings, whereas the rest of the wing is a lot more of a greyish colour. The Caspian tern can be confused with gulls, but it is actually a tern. The Caspian tern has this white belly and the greyish underwings with the black wingtips. The diagnostic feature of the Caspian tern is this robust red bull. So any other red bull terns in the garden route will more likely be found along the coast but will have a lot smaller bull. So this has the largest bull of the turns that we have. The Pied Kingfishers. I'm sure all of you are quite familiar with kingfishers, but there are actually several species of kingfishers which are found in the Garden Root and Plain Karoo. The most common of them are the Pied Kingfisher. The Pied Kingfisher is completely black and white in total. It has that long sharp bill, as is pretty much distinctive with all kingfishers, and it's the only one that is completely black and white. Next up we have the giant kingfisher, which is the largest of our kingfishers. It has this very strong, heavy, sharp bill, and then overall it is quite, uh, quite dark with a lot of white spots on it. So the diagnostic feature of the giant kingfisher is the rufous that is found either on the chest or in the on the belly. So in males, the rufous will be on the chest, whereas in females, the rufous will be on the belly. The Malachite Kingfisher is perhaps our most attractive Kingfisher, but it has this uh, bright orange bull. 
The blue is also quite diagnostic. It has that blue cap and the blue back. So the other, only other blue kingfisher that we have in the region, or the only other aquatic blue kingfisher we have in the region, does not have this orange bowl, and it also does not have the rich colored rufous overall. The Malachite kingfisher is our smallest kingfisher in the region. So onto our swallows. So the white-throated swallow is a migrant, but it's probably our first migrant that appears during the summer months. It usually arrives sometime in late July or August. So the white-throated swallow, as the name suggests, it has this white throat with a blue bar that goes around it. It also has that chestnut forehead and then the blue on the cap, which extends down onto the back of the wings. The brown-throated martin is also a very common, and this one is actually resident, so this one you'll see year-round. Brown-throated martin, as with all swallows and martins, it has a very small bill, but overall, the bird is quite plain and brown. So if you remember the white-throated swallow, it was richly colored with blue. The diagnostic feature of the brown-throated martin, however, is this white belly, which is not found in any other martins in the region, or at least not found in any other regular martins. The contrasting uh, brown chest and white belly is the diagnostic feature. So the warblers, I think I can hear everyone take a sharp intake of breath with these. These are quite a tricky lot to identify, but once you have learned about them, you'll realize they aren't as hard as you might think they are. So our two regular aquatic warblers are the little rush warbler and the lesser swamp warbler. So first up, the little rush warbler is a lot lighter than the lesser swamp warbler. So the little rush warbler is a lot lighter than the lesser swamp warbler. And it has the streaky chest, which as you can see with the lesser swamp warbler, it does not have. It also has these pale pinkish legs which does not appear in the lesser swamp warbler, which has a lot darker black legs. It's a lot darker brown in total as well. So the Levalin cisticular is also a very common bird around water, but not necessarily found in water itself. The Levalin cisticular has this rufousy cap, which can be quite striking, especially in breeding plumage. It has this marked grayish back, which is usual with all cisticulars, and then it has this white chest and belly. So this one is almost always going to be found around water, whereas any other cisticulars are likely to be found elsewhere. And then we have the common waxbill. The common waxbill is a very small bird, and often you won't get a chance to get a look at it up close. But this red face and bowl are quite diagnostic in contrast with the overall brownish appearance. The feathers are actually quite barred, although you don't see that very regularly. As with the red patch on the belly, it is quite distinctive, but you don't see it too regularly. Awesome, and that brings us to the end. Here's a little challenge for you to see if you can identify this bird, which we covered a few slides back. It is a juvenile bird, so it might throw you off a little bit. So just to recap quickly, these are the birds commonly found in or around the garden roots, estuaries, and freshwater bodies. If you have any questions or queries, you are more than welcome to ask. I'm sure Andrew would be happy to answer them for you or you can send me an email at justinponder309 at gmail.com. Awesome. Thank you so much for joining. Okay, so that was our webinar from Justin on freshwater and estuary birds. Um, I wonder if anyone can pop in the chat there ideas around the mystery bird that he left at the end there i don't want to give it away just yet i want people to have an opportunity to try it is a challenging one he's left you with a, a real stinker there so let's see if anyone in the in the chat box will be brave enough to put an answer forward 
if you if you're embarrassed about your answer you can send it just to hosts and panelists not to everyone if you don't want everyone to see okay so we've had one guess in so far for a warbler species i'll tell you i've had one answer that's correct so far anyone else wanting to put an answer forward All right, so I've had a couple of answers in. Oh, sorry, I paused the share there. Um, Jenny, Deirdre, and Angela, and Lynn, you've all got it right. So that was a Lavellan cisticula juvenile. So it had, um, as opposed to the warblers, it wasn't so much brown as, as sort of a tawny color. And it was black on the back and with a red cap. So those two features together should tell you that it's it's not a, a, a warbler species. Uh, it has too much color and difference in its color between the upper and under parts. So it was a Levain cisticula. And this is a bird commonly found in, in reed beds by any sort of wetland, really. A very common one. Um, Olivia's asked in the question answer box. Please, can you explain what rufous means? So rufous is just a reddish color, sort of a, a rusty red as opposed to a, a blood red or um, royal red, if you will. So rufous is sort of a, a brownish red, if I can put it that way. I hope that's useful. Sort of sort of like a rusted, a rusted sort of color, brick, brick red almost. Um, so yeah, rufous is just to describe that kind of color. Jackal buzzards are also a good example of a rufous red on their chest and the tail so there you go all right thanks everyone um, i'm not seeing any other questions in the chat box so um, we're going to leave it there for today your link for your quiz is on the screen right now so i hope you've all hit the qr code and you complete the quizzes if you are joining us the first time you must please complete the quizzes because that's the way we're tracking your participation in these webinars and uh, we're going to it's not about getting top marks for the quiz. It's just about participation because this is just a um, a casual course being offered by BirdLife. It's not an accredited course by any field guides association or anything like that. But we would like to issue certificates for those of you that complete at least five of the 10 sessions. And that means filling in the quizzes. Um, all right. So thanks very much. Great. Have a, a wonderful weekend, everyone. And I'll see you again on Monday. Cheers.